All right, there we are. Hi, Dr. Smart. Good evening, Dr. Patrick. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining me. I'm always so excited when the technology works. <laughs> yeah, I was getting anxious there for a while. I know. I've done a few of these where we've struggled. So uh, thank you for, I'm glad it worked out and great to see you. So um, looks like lots of people are, are signing on, which is great. Um, we'll give people a second to join us. Um, let me just start by saying congratulations on your new role as editor in chief at CMAJ. It's really exciting. Um, and I know it, it's, this is a passion area for you and, and something you've been working work forward to, uh, to and working towards for a long time. So it's certainly well deserved. And I know I'm very excited personally to see what you're going to be doing at the journal. Um, so we're really excited for you to make the time to join us tonight and, and to let the audience that's joining us get to know you and, and for all of us to hear a little bit about your vision uh, for the CMAJ. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Well, thanks. That's really kind. I mean, I sort of fell into this work and um, continued in it because I happen to like it. And, and it's nice to be where I am now, I guess. Excellent. Well, tell us a bit more. I mean, obviously, everyone's here tonight because they want to get to know you. Uh, they want to know your vision for what comes next. So tell us a bit about your background and, and what landed you here as editor of the Canadian Medical Association Journal. So um, you can probably hear from my accent. I'm not Canadian. And I I was born in South Africa. I went to medical school there in the 90s. And after I graduated, I did a general internship. And then I went to work in a rural hospital for a year. That was kind of our two compulsory community service years. And as a rural doc, I loved it. It was, um, it was so exciting. My main responsibility was to run obstetrics and gynae. But really, there was a bit of everything, you know, outpatients, emergency, anesthesiology, bit of minor surgery, orthopedics, occasional cover of the internal medicine ward and peds. And I loved obstetrics, but I loved doing anesthesia more. So I decided to specialize as an anesthesiologist. And then I also moonlighted as a, an, an emergency medicine doctor. So um, in South Africa, intensive care medicine is part of anesthesiology. I don't know if it's still like that, but um, I ended up going to the UK for a while in, in early 2000s to work in an intensive care job. And I had intended to go back, but, you know, doors open forwards. And so um, I ended up continuing for a while in the UK, I had a baby, went into a research job. And then one day I saw an ad for a one year medical ed uh, editor training position at the BMJ. And so I applied and I got it and I went to work there for a year. And that's what got me on my current career trajectory. And then after six and a half years at the BMJ, I, I came to Canada to work as deputy editor under John Fletcher when he was editor in chief. And um, I've been in Canada working at the journal for eight years now. Um, and I've not practiced in Canada. So I'm, uh, I'm a non practicing physician here. And then um, while I was working at the journal, I did a master's in global health policy, which I finished in 2019. So I'm pretty interested in global health and um, global health issues. And I always like to mention that I've, I've, I'm a patient too. I have chronic conditions, lived experience of disability. And, um, and so I've interacted with these three healthcare systems. And I feel like part of that drives me in this work because I have a real vested interest in having a healthcare system that, that works and is there when I need it. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I'll tell you that one of the reasons I chose pediatrics is I spent two summers in Cape Town at the Red Cross Children's right. Hospital when I was a medical student. So my some of my earliest and best clinical experiences were there. I was very impressed with the physicians in South Africa and just the clinical skills, which we can appreciate when we hear you describe just the range of things you were doing. So you obviously mm -hmm. bring a really interesting background and, and having worked in three different countries to the journal, which I think is fantastic. And like you said, that lived experience, which I think is so important. So very interesting. So tell us a bit more from your perspective, uh, what you think are some of the objectives that are shared by the CMAJ and the CMA and, and how you see that moving forward. And also maybe a little bit about for our audience to explain to them a bit what the editorial relationship is between the CMAJ and the CMA. Sure, I can do that. So um, yeah, I think we, 
the obvious answer to your question is the shared objectives is um, that we're coming, we're hopefully going to come out of this COVID pandemic sometime soon. And, and what do we as a profession do and how do our healthcare systems evolve as we emerge from it? You know, so I think no one is really under any illusion that we're going to return to a pre-pandemic normal. Um, so we've got to figure out now what? Um, now, <laughs> the CMA started the CMAJ in 1911, so it's about 110 years old, and they started it with this, I think they said, I'm just going to look at my notes, it's a medium for the expression of all that is good in Canadian medicine, which is kind of lofty and vague, right? And we may not have always achieved that, I think. <laughs> if I wanted to riff off that, I think I would say that I would want readers to say that CMAJ is a medium through which we discover what it means to deliver excellent, kind, and um, equitable healthcare in Canada. And I think that, that CMA and CMAJ share a kind of a vision for an equitable pandemic recovery and looking after the medical profession and delivering to the medical profession the tools that they need. So for CMAJ, I mean, I see... I always see CMAJ as, I mean, not CMAJ, medical journals in general as being, you know, quite integral to the health system because obviously health systems are comprised of building blocks of resources and money, personnel, infrastructure, right? But they also have to know what to do. And medical journals kind of provide that, that evidence-based information that can guide policy decisions and, um, and, and clinical decisions. So, so I guess I see us as being in that space and it's really important for us to develop the kind of, to shepherd and develop and publish the kind of knowledge that we need to move forward equitably after this pandemic. Excellent. Tell us a bit more about that editorial relationship. Cause I know one of the things that's really important is that the CMAJ is separate from the CMA. So I think it's just important for people to understand that you have that editorial independence. Can you explain how that works to our listeners? Sure. Sorry, I didn't, ex I didn't explain that when you asked. Um, no, it's okay. I asked too many questions <laughs> yeah. in a row. <laughs> the, um, so the, the CMA owns CMAJ, just like lots of uh, national medical societies own, own journals. But it was really important for a journal to be credible is for it the editor-in-chief to be editorially independent or for the journal to be editorially independent of its owner. So there will be times that we will publish things that are maybe not quite in agreement with CMA policy and that needs to be okay. And I always think to myself that that shows that CMA is an evolved and mature institution that it can own a journal that it keeps at arm's length and hire an editor in chief that it trusts to run it um, well and as a good representation of, of, of Canadian medicine. But the CMA doesn't interfere at all in editorial decisions. I'm not obliged to tell anybody at the CMA what we plan to publish. Sometimes, you know, occasionally if we're publishing something that's a little, uh, you know, flavorful. Um, I might give my boss a head up, heads up, like the day before, mm -hmm. but they cannot influence what we publish. Yeah, so. I think that's so important, like you say, right, that that there is that independence, um, and that physicians who read the journal can be confident in that, and, and other Canadians who may be interested in the journal to know that it's independent. I think that's really key. So tell us a bit about what are, what are some of the key issues you want to see the CMAJ tackle in today's environment? Like you say, we're, we hope we're coming out of the pandemic. We don't know yet, but we're definitely entering, at least for the next little while here, a different phase. You've touched on health equity. You've touched on lived experience. Tell us a bit more about what you're hoping the journal is going to do. Well, I think the thing that I haven't mentioned right now, which is what I presented to the um, selection committee who picked me and to the CMA board is a big part of my vision and probably what I'll work on for many years during my tenure as EIC is to tackle the ways that CMAJ and medical publishing as a whole are inherently 
racist, oppressive, part of the colonialist structure and patriarchal. So I think that will influence everything that we do for a while. And I know that there are some people out there who, who are not happy to hear this. Um, you know, they think I'm sort of getting on a woke bandwagon, but, but I think that, that COVID it particularly has shone a light on how we operate in the world in this patriarchal and colonialist mm -hmm. society and how it's really time to right some of those wrongs. And as I said, the, the journal, you know, was established 110 years ago. It's, it comes out of that very old patriarchal medical system that we're kind of emerging from that I was trained in, you know, mm -hmm. um, and its structures are set up in that way. And, and we need to turn around and challenge those and say, who are we publishing in the journal? Are there voices that we're not publishing? You know, I mean, I, yeah. so when, um, when I was when I was being interviewed, one of the um, the exercises that I was given at the second round of inter interview was to write an editorial that I might publish as my first editorial, right? And so I thought, okay, what are the, the issues of the day? And I thought about the um, the unmarked graves that were discovered last year, and I thought, I wonder what the CMAJ has ever said about residential schools. So I searched mm -hmm. our entire archive, and I realized that. Prior to 2000, there was only one reference to residential schools, one in like 90 years. And then wow. a couple in the, 2000 and the 2000s. And then um, since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was, uh, report was published, we've, we've used the term residential schools quite a lot in the journal. Now that's like, wow, there's something to tackle there. Um, if we've had a journal that, that didn't see the most glaring inequity under its nose for 90 years so yeah. there's what we've done no i i totally agree with you and i i think it's fascinating because when i just think back to my own medical training just what you're talking about these were not things we ever talked about or learned about i mean it's incredible to me just in 20 years for i guess for me it's been just over 20 years that i've been in practice and when i think back to medical school before that these were not things really that we talked about. And, and when you talk about that pa patriarchal structure, I agree, I trained in that as well. And I often reflect on all the things we need to unlearn in medicine, right? Things that we were right. taught, ways of thinking, ways of approaching our interactions with patients, ways we look at health, ways we look at, you know, society and culture. And there's so much unlearning that needs to happen. And I think also recognition of what is knowledge and who decides what we know and what we don't and how. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of assumptions there that we make also, right? Uh, because we've sort of been told that this is the way you generate knowledge. And it's really just one way of generating right. knowledge. So I find that very interesting. And I'm looking forward to what you're going to do with that, because I think it's uh, so important, uh, especially where we find ourselves right now. And even just the events of the last few weeks here in Canada, I think have been really telling about some of the divisions in our society and some of these ongoing structures that perpetuate systemic racism. We've seen it playing out, I think, day to day. So it's been, it's interesting times for sure. It really um, is. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, you obviously equity and diversity is something that you're really passionate about, which I think is great. Um, and I know that in December, the CMAJ published a letter that was then retracted um, for content that mm -hmm. felt in, in the end on reflection wasn't appropriate to be published. And I think, you know, so many of us go through different experiences in our careers that we learn from. So tell us a little bit about what you learned from that experience and, and how you see moving forward from it. So if, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask, answer your questions in reverse order. Um, Please do. <laughs> How does the journal move forward from a big mistake, like publishing a letter that hurt so many people and was obviously ill thought? Um, the way to do that is by making genuine amends. Um, you know, there was a minute when I thought about uh, resigning, of course, but is that going to is that going to help the situation? And yes, we retracted the letter and I issued an apology on behalf of the journal for publishing it. But we can't just brush it off and, and walk away and think that, you know, there's nothing more to be done. Um, 
So I and my colleagues need to look at the biases and the structural issues that led to that letter being published in the first place. And we're going to work to develop a plan for addressing those issues um, and commit to taking steps that are necessary. And, and some of them have been outlined on, on social media, but where, you know, it, it involves training for the team, um, working with consultants. It's involving commissioning articles that look at dis different aspects of the, of the topic that was essentially raised by the letter. Um, but, you know, that are more conducive to uh, amplifying a Canadian Muslim doctors and setting Canadian Muslim doctors in a in a great light and highlighting the harms of Islamophobia both in medical training um, and in medicine generally. Um, and then to go on to what I learned from the experience. Uh, I mean, I learned many things and I'm just, I think I'll just list a few off the top of my head. Um, I've learned very quickly and in a short space of time about, you know, the shapes of some of my biases. I've learned a bit more about that. Um, I've learned about Islamophobia in a kind of a global context from an anthropologist um, who studies Islamic life in Canada and, and elsewhere. Um, you know, and examining biases is not new territory for me because, as you know, I said I was born in South Africa, so yeah, there's, mm -hmm. there's stuff that I've had to face from the time I was a teen. And I'm really sorry that the learning that I had came at other people's expense, though. I'm really sorry about that. So I've learned that having a public profile is a real privilege and that I should really take care when I occupy the this, this space that I'm in. Um, and I've learned that you can work really hard for a long time to build trust and then just damage it in a day. And it's mm -hmm. quite important not to do that. Somebody, uh, Shannon Riziki from Calgary wrote to me and said, this is, this is serious. It's like a, a medical error. And I thought that was a really clever way of helping me to understand it, that it's something that is really serious and you have to be sorry um, and genuinely sorry, but you have to learn from it and make sure that mm -hmm. it never happens again. So I guess I learned from that metaphor. And then also I think I learned, you know, CMAJ is not my journal that I get to just sort of casually publish someone's opinion in. It's, it's not even the CMA's journal, it's the Journal of the Physicians of Canada and it should reflect all of them. And then I think the last thing that I would say that I've learned is how kind and forgiving most of the people that I've spoken to, and I've spoken to a lot who were hurt by the letter, um, so kind and forgiving and willing to give second chances and help in the future. So yeah, that's a good learning for me. Yeah, it's all, I'm always amazed by uh, the grace of other people, as you mm -hmm. say, it is always amazing. And there's a lot of learning there. And, and I, I think you're right. I think, you know, many, all of us, I don't know anyone in medicine who hasn't made a mistake or had an error or something they've regretted. I, I think that's part of this work in whatever context. But as you said, I often think what's important is, is to take something away from it and not do the same thing again. Um, mm. And I think there's lots of learning for all of us as all of us have to examine our biases and move through this world and it comes back to that idea of sort of unlearning and learning new things. And um, I'm looking yeah. forward to what, what you're going to do next. Um, you know, when we're thinking about medical research in Canada and we're looking ahead to sort of, again, that post pandemic world, what are some of the key issues or themes that you think we should be looking towards? So I'll tell you what I hope for, but I don't know that this work is well funded anywhere, um, even in Canada, because the pandemic has taught us a bunch of important things, I think. Um, and to me, it seems like throughout the pandemic, CMAJ has been publishing a lot of work on shows that social determinants of health, racism, and so on, are driving inequities in COVID-19 testing, infection rates, clinical outcomes, access to care, right? And none of this is new. Researchers have been trying to tell us about the importance of social determinants of health for decades. I just think that the 
pandemic made it really stuck. We're waking up to this idea that maybe the best investment of our healthcare dollars is actually tackling some of these problems properly and comprehensively instead of, you know, putting a bandaid over them. And I've sort of said for years, I'm kind of tired of seeing studies that give us greater insight into the size of the problem. Like you turn your lens on some aspect of inequity for some particular oppressed or structurally disadvantaged group that has worse, worse health outcomes than you figure out that yes indeed they have worse health co- outcomes in this particular area as well um but what i really want to see is i'm kind of aching to see the kind of work that begins to show us what are the solutions what innovative in- interventions work to solve these wicked inequity problems and how can we scale them up and that's Mm -hmm. the kind of work that i want to see us do um have in cmaj now i don't know if if that work is even being funded but it would be great to have work on the solutions yeah no it makes so much sense i think you're right it's so easy sometimes to only think about problems and not look at strengths or what to do right? Just right. always talking about what's wrong and, and how do we move the dial on some of these complex issues. And I totally agree with you. I think what's been fascinating to me about the pandemic, when we think about the system and just why, you know, social determinants, why some people are healthy, other people aren't. Like you said, you know, none of this is news. These are all things we knew. They just weren't things that were being talked about so much. I, I think to me, I feel like the pandemic has brought forward to the fore so many issues in our society. And now they're like in the bright lights and people mm-hmm. can't kind of deny that they're there. Um, and, you know, when you look through history, it always seems like pandemics have heralded major change, societal changes, right? Shifts in how people organize themselves, you know, our more social mores, our morals, our ways of doing things. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see if we can move forward from this pandemic with a, an actual commitment to solutions to some of these health equity problems as you're talking about not just acknowledging they're there not just defining them but can we actually finally now take action on some of these issues and i think it's going to yeah. be fascinating to see where this lands um and like you you're saying you know as healthcare professionals what work are we doing to actually promote solutions. So I, I, I hope that research is happening and being funded. Yeah, um, so. And I would yeah. love to see it, the answers. <laughs> I mean, looking at it from the other side, you know, where you were saying that it's sort of been in, in headlights, um, this, this inequity stuff, and that we've been able to see that some people are, are really disadvantaged with respect to others. I really hope that what's happened is that those of us who are privileged, and I think this has happened, we are recognizing our privilege we've seen because of the pandemic how protected we are in our kind of money bubbles that enable us to shelter in place and be safe and and not have to connect with the outside world and work from home um and i really hope we don't forget that yeah oh it's absolutely true you know everyone's lived through the pandemic but not everyone's had access to the same resources or shelters to do so right and yeah i think that's really really important um we know that covid has brought to light a lot of these gaps um how do you see the cmaj sort of preparing for those or how what's the path forward do you think for us it's um it's tricky i mean i should I should probably, you know, emphasize that CMAJ and journals in general are part of the problem. And to hark back to what I was saying before, we we also need to do the work to um, to look at the ways that we process and publish and and the topics that we focus on and um, and just make sure that you know that we're focusing on the on the right stuff um, or at least giving attention to to all the stuff <laughs> mm-hmm. sorry that wasn't very eloquent but um but you kind of <laughs> <nice. laughs> yeah no no I do I have another question for you just sort of what we were talking about before you know I, I think it's interesting there's certain you know ways we value knowledge in medicine right with the sort of mm-hmm. the randomized control trial being 
our kind of gold standard, <laughs> but obviously it doesn't answer all the questions. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts on are on different ways the CMAJ could could profile or expose people to different ways of knowing or different types of ways that knowledge is generated, or if that's something mm -hmm. that you that you think about. Yeah, so we I, that makes me think about it. An analysis article that we published on um, in indigenous led research and indigenous ways of knowing mm -hmm. and um it's one of it's a very one of our highly read articles um like it, it's always being accessed and i was thinking um a bit about how to expand on that in the journal going forward i think there is work being done to help um physicians to understand you know, medical knowledge from different perspectives. And a lot of it, it mm -hmm. has to do with patient involvement in research. So um, when I guess when I was doing research and, um, and when I was training, it was very unusual to have mixed methods research. But during the time that I've been working as an editor, I've seen this become like really more commonplace. So when you plan a research study, you plan a quantitative component that looks at certain outcomes and a qualitative component that looks at other outcomes. And you're asking different aspects of a, a larger research question using those different designs. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is involving patients from the start of research right now. So SPORE kind of made that happen in Canada to bring in patients and, and a prioritized patient-oriented research that asks what are patients' priorities in the healthcare space. So... Um, you know, what, what, what outcomes are important to patients when we're researching things? I was thinking of an, an example that, um, that I heard about one time where these folks were designing a research study and they were interested in adverse events related to dialysis. And they involved patients from the beginning and the, and the patient said, well, the most important thing to us is um, itching after dialysis. Like we get really, really itchy. And the physicians were, well, that's never even been on our radar, but this is the most important thing to patients. So starting to involve patients in um, our ways of thinking is, is kind of a, a huge shift, I think. No, it's so true, right? And I, I often reflect on that. I think so much of what we do in medicine is provider centric, right? We ask yeah. questions that we want to know the answers to at a pace and on an agenda that suits us. It's not often necessarily centered on what the patient wants, or we don't even always tell them why we're asking the questions or give them the options to answer. I, I always, almost feel like sometimes it's a interrogation more than it is a relationship, right? And I think it's interesting yeah. with research too, uh, that question of, are we really addressing the things that matter to the people experiencing the illness? Or is it the things that we think are important? And I think that's such a great example of where suddenly when you ask patients, what matters to them wasn't even on the the page for the physician. That's very telling. Um, and yeah. I think speaks to the importance of involving patients and what are the outcomes that, that matter to them? And are we asking the right questions uh, to get to those outcomes yeah. that are important? Yeah. Yeah. And how well are we listening? I mean, I remember a, yes. a really influential um, pediatrics teacher that I had who said, listen to the mom or listen to the parents they will tell you the diagnosis and and that was like really great for me and i have this such a i've worked in scenarios where there's time pressure and you don't have a lot of time for a history but i've also been a patient where it's been so frustrating when i get to see the doctor for two minutes and they don't even really ask me what i think is important so yeah yeah no, it's true. I think it's a lesson for all of us, right? Sometimes, you know, just asking people, what do you think is going on and what matters mm -hmm. to you today can be yeah. the most important questions, right? So that you have yeah, to sure. get to get to the heart of it. Well, that's great. Well, I really, uh, is there anything else you wanted to share? I really appreciate you spending your time with us tonight. I'm really excited about your vision for the CMAJ and, and just what it's going to contribute for all of us as we move forward over these next months and years. Is there any other final thoughts or things that you wanted to share before we conclude? No, not really. I, it's been wonderful chatting to you and um, I've enjoyed it much more than I thought I would. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> but I think we spoke before and you said you're a natural talker. And I said, I'm really not. I'm more of a listener. So, um, yeah, <laughs> you're helping me out here. <laughs> well, you have, I think, many very interesting things to say. And I do admit I do like talking. Mike, that's what my kids always say to me. Mom, you're chat, chat, <laughs> chat. So there you go. But it's been wonderful. I think you've got some incredible ideas. And obviously, you bring this amazing background on so many levels. And I'm really excited uh, to see what you do with the journal. I think it's going to be a really exciting time ahead. And it's amazing. I think you're our first female editor. Is that also true? That's true. But if we're... If we're... <laughs> If we're truthful about it, in twice that I know of them, when the journal's been in crisis, a female uh, interim editor in chief has been pulled in. So you know, women can do this job. Um, <laughs> but there I think you go. I'm the first that's one telling to too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but I think that's exciting. exciting. <laughs> but awesome. it's uh, yeah. I look forward to working alongside you. It'll, it, it's great. Yeah, me as well. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks to everyone who joined us, and I hope everyone has a safe and relaxing evening. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.